must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the HET Podcast. My name is Brandon Pollan, and I am your host this evening. And today, I am really excited to bring on three special guests to talk about a variety of issues, um, really focusing around effective clinical education, mentoring, and clinical instruction. As tonight, I am joined by Don Reagan, Lauren Schrank, and Joe DeHope. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, I'll briefly introduce our guests, and then I will have them share their stories following that. So to start off, of course, we have the one and only Don Reagan, who, if you haven't heard of him, he is now the current chair of the Knoxville District of the Tennessee Physical Therapy Association, along with being um, a practitioner and professional development coordinator at Total Rehab at Cherokee, Maryville, Tennessee, and he is also adjunct faculty with South College. Um, now, Lauren and Joe are current are, um, students from South College, um, and they actually graduate next week, and they're, it's very, very exciting to see their upcoming career routes. And, you know, thank you all for all that you do and for coming on this evening to discuss kind of these topics and your perspective. Um, but, you know, before we dive into these topics, would you guys kind of just briefly um, go through a little bit more about who you each are and kind of give us your story about how you each got to where you are today? And, and Don, let's start with you, then followed by Lauren, then Joe after that, if that works. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for having us uh, on on for uh, this interview, and uh, really love talking about being a clinical instructor and about mentorship and the pursuit of mastery. Uh, I started out in my career. I was actually a sophomore in high school in Ocean City, New Jersey, and my phys ed teacher owned uh, a gym in town. It was called Iron Raider Gym and Fitness, and I uh, begged him for uh, a job and was uh, worked the front desk for uh, the remainder of my high school career, stopped playing organized sports and just fell in love with strength training, competed in Olympic style weightlifting as a senior in high school, and then went off to undergraduate and competed in powerlifting. So my my passion was really in the strength sports and in uh, performance enhancement. I had a really cool experience as a high schooler where I had found solace in the weight room individually. And then my junior year, I bought my grandmother, whom I lived with, uh, a membership to a women's and senior citizens gym, a, a very different space. And uh, for Christmas, I bought her a, a month's membership and really just encouraged her to go. And at this point, she was probably in her early 80s. And uh, with enough enough coaxing and encouraging, she made uh, the commitment to go. It was right next to the grocery store. And she, uh, she started going regularly. And I found that uh, it was a transformative experience for her just like it was for me. And so seeing how exercise and community uh, could change my life as a you know teenager and then see how it could change my grandmother's life in her early 80s to increase her independence and increase her quality of life was just so awesome. It was really exciting. And so I ended up majoring in exercise science in undergraduate. And uh, while I was there, all the smart kids were pre-PT. Uh, I didn't really know what that was. I feel like sometimes I'm the only physical therapist who's never had a catastrophic injury uh, that led them to the profession. But uh, that nevertheless, that is me. And so uh, I decided to shoot high and uh, pursue PT school and uh, did an internship at Duke University Healthcare Systems between undergrad and grad school, uh, got into PT school and uh, never looked back. So it's been a, been a great uh, career uh, choice for me. Uh, I wouldn't want to do anything else more than what I'm doing right now. I'm nine years out of DPT school and have found 
a particular love in teaching uh, both as an adjunct but also as a clinical instructor. Hey, so um, similar to Dawn, I uh, really transitioned into PT school uh, after having some weightlifting background. Um, so I was a I, kind of a multi-sport athlete growing up. Um, grew up in a small town of like 6,000 people in Texas. Um, so everyone plays every sport. Um, so I was doing basketball, volleyball, and uh, softball, and then transitioned to mostly volleyball. And uh, throughout my time, I actually ended up getting arthroscopic knee surgery in eighth grade uh, for osteochondritis desiccans in my right knee. And uh, yeah, so after that, I had actually pretty subpar physical therapy, which I didn't realize how subpar it was until actually coming to school. And the more I've learned, um, there was no transition to return to sport. It was pretty much just, oh, you can, you know, you're straight leg, leg raising for six weeks and now you're stripped up. So go hang out and let's do some more volleyball. And of course, I couldn't jump the height of a credit card and, um, you know, just struggled with uh, tons of injuries in that knee. Um, so even still with that, I didn't really think of physical therapy as a profession. I came into my undergraduate at the University of Texas as a journalism major. I uh, wanted to do sports journalism because I uh, love sports, but uh, quickly found out that that was not for me. That type of lifestyle was just not conducive to a family. And um, I just wanted to do something that I felt had a little bit more value in the world. And not, while there is uh, you know, some value in media, it's not necessarily what, where I find um, happiness. And so from there, I was like, all right, well, I like exercise, but I don't want to necessarily be uh, a personal trainer. So I found physical therapy and uh, switched my major to exercise science and um, went from there. So unlike my two compatriots, I do not have any competitive weightlifting experience, although I'm not a stranger to weightlifting in the weight room in general. Uh, my, my story is a little bit more of the standard. I uh, had a knee surgery for an overuse injury and meniscal tear in high school. I was a competitive basketball player at the time. Uh, wound up going into undergrad as an exercise science and pre-PT major at the University of Nebraska. And during my time there, I actually transitioned away from PT as a career path and really started, you know, setting my sights on coaching in some way, shape or form. I didn't know if it was going to be basketball or more strength and conditioning. And so following that path, I moved down to Knoxville and got my master's degree at the University of Tennessee. I was a graduate assistant in the strength and conditioning department and got my master's in sports psychology and motor behavior. And as much fun as that was, as rewarding as that was, it just never quite scratched the itch. And so I finally circled all the way back around and went back to South College for my DPT degree. And so that is the short version of, of me kind of knowing all along where I wanted to be. And I wouldn't change the path I took to be here, but I'm happy to be where I'm at and where I am moving forward. I love it. I love how each of your stories are different, yet kind of similar in some ways. And I think it's really good to kind of get that perspective. And you know, before we kind of dive into specifically, you know, the specifics of clinical education from your guys' perspective, I want to start with kind of a more broader question on this topic because, you know, we've heard from many students um, throughout the podcast and even from just messaging how some have felt very unprepared for the clinical world once they've entered the workforce as an independent clinician from after graduation. Now, of course, understanding that this is, of course, student and program dependent and there's a lot of other things involved with this. But what are your guys' thoughts on why this phenomenon of students not feeling or being prepared for the real-life clinical environment is happening on the scale that it's happening across the country? Sure, Brandon. I think it's an excellent question, and I don't, I don't pretend to have all the answers to that. I'm sure it's a multifactorial and complex uh, answer. But I, I, I would put uh, the, the emphasis on and the importance of the internships, clinical rotations that both the student and the school and the director of clinical education, you know, together make those decisions. I, I think that the emphasis and the responsibility needs to be placed on that combination of potential clinical instructors and clinical sites, uh, the student and the DCE, which is what makes it so complex is there's a lot of moving parts. I've never been a DCE myself, so I don't pretend to know how challenging that role is. It seems very hard from the outside looking in, but as a CI, I spend a, a lot of uh, effort and energy to get to know my students well ahead of time. And I do 
uh, lots of conversation and lots of discussion to uh, just tr to try to make sure that this is uh, an optimal fit for both of us because I think that confidence comes from those clinical exposures. And if it's a good fit, it's a good match between the CI and the student, then I think they are much better prepared for practice. Not that what I do is the right way or the best way. Uh, I think that outpatient, I, I'm an outpatient orthopedic provider and that's all I've ever done. And that's really all that I, that I know really within our profession. But I don't, uh, I don't pretend to, to believe that what I do is necessarily the right or best way. But what I do think I am successful at as a CI is I'm, I am able to help my student to build their confidence and build their competence in what they're doing so that when they are finished with their last clinical with me, like Joe and Lauren, we've spent six months together. And today was actually our very last day together. And I think that they can speak for themselves, but I think that over that, that time frame, that their strengths and their confidence has grown significantly because they've been able to work on my ethos uh, as a platform and the confidence that I'm able to give to them and, and, and be able to help them meet patients where they are so that they can take those skills. A lot of them are intangible. You know, they've been taught so many great things in school, lots of knowledge and lots of science. But a good mentor is somebody who brings along their student, their, pu their pupil, and they put them in a thousand different situations and helps them to kind of work through different scenarios that, that are invariably going to happen in the clinic. And so I think having that type of confidence, as I've watched Joe and Lauren uh, mature and transform so much over the last six months clinically, and I think that both of them would admit that they, they feel so much more prepared for this clinical practice in general. It's not about teaching one particular you know, model or approach. I think it's about teaching reasoning and metacognition and uh, some of those bigger concepts of trying to integrate things and, uh, and try to, to, to best interact with patients. But um, I really think that it's about the CIs. I think students who have really good clinical experiences and have a good bond with their CI, they end up leveraging that relationship long after their internship is over. I'm, I stay in touch with many of my students and uh, they still give me the honor and the, the privilege to be involved in their careers uh, as well as in their personal lives. They, they, they look at me as a, as a mentor uh, for life and, and it's such an honor uh, and I'm humbled by that opportunity. So I really think that the, the responsibility lies on those steps towards the end of the, the DPT curriculum that uh, I think it's the CI's responsibility to uh, invest wholeheartedly into their students. Yeah, no, I completely agree, Don. And you brought up so many intricacies and kind of subtopics of this, which we'll dive into a little bit more later. So I appreciate you kind of foreshadowing us there. Um, but, you know, I'm curious because, you know, Joe and Lauren, you both kind of recently just finishing. And of course, you know, from your perspective now as still a student, I'd love to kind of know what your guys' thoughts are on the same topic as well. And, and Lauren, how about you start and then Joe follow up. We'll follow up with you after that one. Yeah, so uh, I definitely agree with everything Don said. I think um, one thing that made my and Joe's clinical so great was that um, I knew Don and started talking with him on the phone over a year before our clinical even began. So that trust was already pretty much built. So on day one, there wasn't this kind of getting to know you period. It was, uh, I immediately was receptive to his feedback and he knew uh, a bit about me and how how I react to things. So that was one thing that was beneficial. Also, um, just from talking to other people and other students and other programs, uh, a six-month clinical is fairly long compared to a lot of people's longest clinical. And uh, a lot of people at South could either do one place for six months or uh, split it between two places, so do two three-month clinicals. And um, my friends who I know who did that, it just doesn't seem like they had as good of an experience because um, like they, their first three months, it was with someone who um, had a completely different practice pattern than their second one. So they come out of school with two completely different ways of thinking and ways of doing stuff, not really knowing what they want to do, not really finding their place with with that. And so, um, again, it is, you know, very complex, but um, that's something I've observed different. I think that's a really good point because I know the time, optimal time for um, effective clinical education or what's the best seems to be currently uh, debated a lot. So I think that's a really good point to bring up because 
there's definitely some differences that you had kind of mentioned, and I'm sure there's other things too involved with that that can certainly contribute. So that's a, that's a fantastic point. Joe, how about you? Yeah, I think uh, something that's that really jumped out at me the last couple of weeks reflecting back on this six-month internship was that even though, you know, Donna's a great, you know, general outpatient orthopedic practitioner who doesn't, you know, identify himself as a shoulder guy or a back guy or a knee guy, uh, over the six months, Lauren and I didn't really get to see that many elbows. And sometimes that's just the way things go with clinical rotations. You get more exposure to certain things. And so I think when the training wheels are taken off for new grads and they didn't have a lot of exposure to other things and they don't have that, you know, comfort of a safety net and, you know, CI that they've gotten comfortable with and, and feel safe and secure, you know, asking for guidance, that it can be really overwhelming when they're walking into a brand new clinic. Maybe they're, you know, they got a job where they hadn't done a rotation before. And I'm lucky that being a little bit of an older student in my cohort and having worked, you know, for a few years before jumping into PT, I have some more, you know, work experience and in, in interacting with people. But for, you know, kind of the young guns who are coming right out of undergrad into PT school, you know, this might be the very first, you know, career type, you know, full-time job for them. And this is a lot of responsibility. You know, you have people coming in, you know, seeing you with, with pain and dysfunction. And there's a lot more pressure than just filling out Excel sheets and making sales calls and things. So I think that depending on, you know, the clinical environment, your clinical instructor you had, you know, it could kind of be a perfect storm for a really, really stressful place to be in. And I'm just thankful that I'm not in that place. Yeah, no, Joe, I, I concur. I think that's a really good point. And especially like that point about, you know, seeing only a certain amount of things within the clinical um, experience clinically wise. And of course, that's just kind of the way the cards might be dealt at that time. So I think that's another really solid point to bring up. And, you know, Don, I'd like to kind of, you know, you're, I want to go back to your answer a little bit and kind of dive more into this because that's kind of more the uh, topic of discussion this evening. So let's start off from the beginning when it comes to being a CI. So what are some characteristics or prereqs that a newer PT should possess before taking that first student? Like when's the right time to start being a CI? Brandon, that's another excellent question. And it's one that I've pondered and been asked before. In its most simplest form, I think I've narrowed it down to two things. Uh, one is that are you clinically proficient? So beyond just competent and beyond confident, but are you proficient? Meaning, can you do a thorough evaluation? You know, I think generally, let's say 45 minutes to an hour in most outpatient orthopedic settings. Can you do an evaluation? Can you build a therapeutic alliance? You know, buy-in. Can you do a good... A physical examination, can you come up with a diagnosis and a prognosis, a plan of care, prescribe an HEP or some sort of lifestyle modifications, and get your documentation done in about an hour and feel really good about it. If you can do that, then I think you have the proficiency to start bringing a student in and say, hey, I'm, I'm ready to bring on that extra layer of challenge and accountability that comes with a student. And so for me, that was, I would say I was about four to five years out of school before I felt really good about doing a really thorough, solid evaluation. And then my second criteria is the humility to be able to step back and allow a student to take center stage and allow them to work off of your brand and your reputation. And again, this word ethos, to be able to stand on my ethos and have my confidence behind them, have my support and my trust and my love behind them so that they can interact with a patient who is vulnerable, who is in pain, who is seeking help, and to be able to step back and allow a student to, uh, to do their best and to exercise what they know and to even allow them to make a mistake as long as, it, of course, it's safe and professional, but allow them to even make a mistake in clinic and to learn from their mistakes and how maybe they communicate or the uh, order of interventions that they select, something like that. And so I think those are the two things that are clinical proficiency and then the humility to be able to uh, bring a young clinician uh, kind of so underneath your wing, so to speak, and help them to grow. Yeah, I think that's a really, really solid answer, and that seems to make a lot of sense. But, you know, Don, I, I want to kind of dive one more avenue into this just a little bit. Um, of course, be, ha, being that one avenue for initial development to be a CI is, of course, the APTA's 
um, CI credentialing courses, of course, the level one, the level two. Um, what are your thoughts on the APTA CI credentialing courses as a first start for kind of really developing and kind of figuring out how to be a CI? Certainly. I, I took that course when I was about four or five years out of school, and I, I'm not sure I did it before my first PT student, but somewhere in the first few, I would say in the first one or two or three students, I, I took that course at the University of Lynchburg uh, in the, the DPT program there. It was taught by Leanne Eagler. And I think firstly, like any class, it really depends on the quality of instruction and who, uh, you know, kind of their teaching style. But I think it's a wonderful course. And I paid out of pocket for that. My employer did not uh, support that. I did not get compensated or reimbursed for that. But to me, it was worth it to spend two days thinking about being a clinical instructor. And I didn't do it because I could check the box when a school, you know, asks me, are you a CI credentialed, you know, instructor? I did it because I genuinely wanted to be the best CI that I could be. And I think dedicating two days to being with other interested clinicians who want to mentor students, uh, I thought it was worth it. And so the, uh, the, the booklet that it gave me, I'll tell you, one of the things that I learned from that class was the importance of being uh, structured and having, like, there was a bunch of forms in that in that manual that, that I that I liked, uh, and so I, I think that having a little bit of structure, especially for a student that maybe is going through some sort of remediation, I think is really 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 important. Uh, some of the things that I also learned from that course were uh, setting expectations and being real clear about what are the learning objectives and what do we expect the student to be at this certain time, and so. Putting some structure and some framework to being a CI, I think, is really important. Uh, I, I, would, I would like to say, I'd like to even go as far to say that I think that type of content should be a prerequisite. Not that I think that can be mandated by the APTA, but I think that schools, uh, and I think DCEs, I think it would really benefit CIs if DCEs were to offer that type of information just, you know, freely, like in the email, you know, you get an email and it says, hey, so-and-so is getting ready to come to your clinic. Here's all this information. Maybe it comes in a packet, you know, a little bit of, of, of information about adult learning theory or about how to give feedback, maybe some little module that you could do online where you're learning basic skills as a, as a CI, as a mentor, I think could really help. And I, I like the idea of schools doing that a little bit differently. So I'm not saying that the APTA CI credentialing course should be required or a prerequisite, but I would love to see DCEs put more effort and energy into preparing their CIs beyond just making sure they know how to fill out the CPI, the actual theory and science behind how do we be better mentors and better teachers. No, I, I agree. And to add on a little bit more to that, taking the class last or two years ago now, I think one thing that I really liked about it is there was a lot of role playing, especially involving kind of different uh, clinical encounters or situations with the student varying from um, a very successful student to a struggling student and kind of some area kind of in between and different avenues. So I really liked how there was a lot of practice um, and role play with feedback. Um, that was certainly very, very helpful because I personally hadn't thought about how I would respond to some of those situations, but going through that course kind of really helped shed some more enlightenment on maybe a better way to either frame it or how to kind of handle that situation. So I think that was, I was something that was also um, valuable to that. And, you know, Don, I, I kind of want to go to the, um, you know, the DCE here a little bit because, you know, I've heard from some students that they've had freedom to contact Scythe to arrange a future clinical experience for their education. However, I also know that some programs have strictly prohibited this. Um, I'd love to kind of know what are each of your thoughts on this topic. And, and actually, Lauren, let's start off with you for this one. I'm kind of curious to kind of hear, you know, the, the student perspective. Yeah, so I, I think it's essential, honestly, to, to contact beforehand. Uh, and again, like I said, build that trust. I, I don't think that programs should strictly prohibit that. I, uh, I don't know why they would, honestly. And I know they were trying to get like fairness between students and all that, but if you've connected with someone you deem as a mentor and you want to learn from them and they feel the same way, then I think that that should be encouraged. Yeah, no, I, I concur. Joe, what do, you, do you have anything to add on to that as well? Yeah, I think Lauren nailed it there. If there's you know a CI and a student who have a connection and they want to work together, 
then I don't think it's, you know, in a program's place to step in on their toes. Now, if it's somebody who is a student who wants to set up a rotation with somebody who's five minutes from their house, and it's just a matter of convenience, and, you know, the school has a you know, reputation of, of that clinic maybe using and abusing students, that's where having a little bit more, you know, oversight and stepping in would be helpful. But I'm just thankful that Lauren and I were able to you know, have a relationship set up ahead of time with Don as an instructor and him being an adjunct faculty member within our program, you know, there was there was no trouble on trying to get contracts in place and whatnot. And so I think if you, know, you have an instructor and student who were, you know, getting along well together and there's not a reason, you know, based on past experiences that you should let them get off and running. It's a personal experience. So every every connection is going to be different. Yeah. And Don, I'd like to kind of see what your thoughts are on this topic. And I'd love to also kind of know your hypotheses or some other reasons that you can think of as to why uh, sites or school, or excuse me, why schools would strictly prohibit this kind of a thing. Sure. I see DCEs as overseers, as uh, individuals who are working very hard to make sure that all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. And so that comes from a legal perspective. It comes from a relationship perspective. It comes from making sure that the students are getting the diverse experiences that are required by CAPTI and, and, by, and by the program itself. And so that's how I perceive DCEs. I certainly uh, have been on the negative end of that, of having students contact me uh, very interested in doing a clinical, but then having someone in their school uh, squash the idea because there was too much, I think maybe even the word fraternization was used or uh, the fact that maybe as a CI, I would be biased because now I had a student who had shown interest. And so uh, I have lost opportunities. In fact, one of, one of uh, a potential student that I was really looking forward to attracting uh, and, and to working with is now in the MBA. And uh, he wanted to do his internship with me, and I wanted to do uh, the same. And uh, unfortunately, his clinical education department said that that was against the rules, and they weren't comfortable with him coming to to be my student because we had already made contact. And so I, I, I don't really know. I think it's probably a control thing. Uh, it's also a trust thing. I know that when I was in PT school, uh, my DCE gave uh, gave me uh, some freedom and latitude to pursue different clinical interests, particularly because of I had some really unique interests um, and that that wasn't necessarily given to other members in my class. I think the, the rule was you were not allowed to contact any potential CIs without the DCE's uh, approval. And so I don't know why that's, that's the rule. I, I assume it has to do with control and has to do with some of the chaos that comes, you know, with that. And you certainly don't want to upset, C, you know, potential CIs or practices with a student who thinks they want to do one thing and then they change their mind. Um, but South College seems to have done a, a pretty good job of giving students the appropriate amount of autonomy to list their top 10 or top 20 sites and then have some interview processes encouraged. They have their students actually do some film themselves, you know, exp expressing their interest and why they think they would be a good fit. And then they're, they encourage interviews, and then the student gets an opportunity to kind of retool their order and, you know, have some balance between, you know, what does the clinical education department think and what does the student think and the CI. I think it's a complex process, uh, so I, I certainly don't have uh, maybe the, the solution. I just know that on my end as the CI that I've had significantly more success when I have been able to uh, make contact with students and build relationship, because as Lauren after mentioned, there's already this built in trust. They know that uh, kind of who I am and how, how I communicate or how I think. And this idea that, that they know what they're getting themselves into. I think so much of the anxiety comes from what kind of environment are they going to be in? Not just the brick and mortar or where things are, but you know, how am I going to be? Am I going to, you know, be the kind of person that fluctuates on a daily basis, or am I going to be a fairly consistent person? And that, uh, you know, how do I relate to them and, and vice versa? I think there's, you know, so many times I, I often felt early on with students I didn't know well, that no matter how long their clinical was, I felt like I, I spent the first half of it just getting to know them. And that's why I started to pursue students, uh, you know, earlier and sooner, or vice versa. I enjoyed when students would contact me and they were even pre-PT or they had just started PT school. 
And I thought it was wonderful. And with, with social media and the internet, it's just so easy to do that now. There's so many mediums to make contact that I think that even with DCEs being maybe somewhat old school and trying to prohibit that, it's, it's going to happen. And so I think we need to find a way as a profession to support healthy relationships between CIs and students. Furthermore, some programs consider clinical instructors to be, you know, in a way sort of on faculty or, or kind of as a supplemental faculty. And so if you're going to trust me with your student for anywhere from eight weeks to 24 weeks, then I think you should also be comfortable trusting me with uh, a screening process or with some sort of interview and relationship building process to make sure that everyone, the kind of the constituents involved are comfortable. Yeah. And Don, that kind of goes back to the, uh, the kind of the recent article in PTJ kind of going through the education leadership partnership, because one of the big themes and topics that, you know, we have heard from that. And of course that was kind of mentioned in the, best practices for physical therapists, clinical education task force was kind of really building this collaborative partnership um, between academics and clinical sites. So I think that certainly is um, an avenue in there that you've kind of just met, you've kind of just mentioned there. Um, You know, Don, I know you both, you all had kind of gone through the screening method and system in, in place a little bit beforehand, but I want to dive into a little bit more detail because I'm not sure um, how many clinical instructors across the country are actually doing some form of this. So I kind of like to get kind of a full scope of what you do just to kind of really get it out there for consideration for others. So would you mind kind of expanding more on this method and kind of somewhat what are the green red lights that you look up for specifically? Sure. It's actually, it's really, I think it's really simple at this point in my, in my career. I've been a CI to 25 PT students over the last seven years. And so I've gone through this journey with people quite a bit, folks that have worked out and folks that have not. And so it's very simply, if I could simplify this down to what am I looking for? I think you might even laugh at this, but I'm looking for someone that I'm excited to spend 40 to 50 hours a week with, that I feel comfortable and excited to learn from them and learn with them on a daily basis. When you spend 40 to 50 hours with somebody, that's a lot of time and it's a lot of commitment. So I'm looking for someone who has the maturity uh, that is really all into this profession and that we share uh, quite a bit of the same interests within our profession. Uh, So I'm looking for compatibility. uh, I'm looking for how accessible they are. Uh, So one of the things early on in my career that I would uh, really kind of look for is if I called a student, did they answer? And maybe not, don't want to sound so egocentric that I expected them to answer every time, but would they get back to me? And I I look for the quality of their writing, let's say in an email, how professional is their email? One of my favorite things to do is, uh, is actually go on their social media platforms and to read kind of how do they interact with others and what kind of things do they post online. And so I've, I've done quite a bit of that. If I have anybody in common with them, then I will oftentimes contact previous employers or previous uh, co- collegial uh, relationships or students or coaches, anybody that I know uh, that we have in common. And I, I like to get some personal references. So I really try to leverage as much as I can because I, I'm looking forward to inviting this person you know, into my life. Uh, both professionally and personally, and I want to add value to them, and I want them to add value to me and what I'm doing. And so I, I want someone that I can learn from, and I, I can speak you know, publicly and say that Joe and Lauren have been absolutely wonderful human beings to spend the last six months with, and that I have learned and grown so much by them being in my life for the last six months. And so it's been such a mutually beneficial relationship. That's ultimately what I'm looking for because I'm a better human being when I'm a, when I have a student around, I'm a better clinician. I'm a better husband. I'm a better father. I'm just better at life uh, because this is part of who I am. It's part of, you know, kind of what makes me the best me is by having a young person around who is excited and ambitious and ready to, to kind of mature and grow and make this difficult transition from theory to practice. Yeah, no, that seems really, really logical. And I really kind of like your flow there. And I know it was mentioned earlier that um, you'd spend about a year um, beforehand, ideally trying to get to know them. Do you have any like formal structure to how you kind of do that? Or you just have a certain list of things you got to you're trying to get through a certain time or like, how, how does that, how, would you mind expanding a little bit more on that, Don? Yeah, sure. Uh, the short answer is no. 
I have no structure. <laughs> and I would only create structure if I was trying to replicate this, let's say, in colleagues or staff. If I, if I owned a practice, then I think I would be forced to create some level of structure or paper trail. But because this is just me doing this on the side, I'm not, not um, encouraged by anybody in my work life to do this. I do this electively uh, because I feel like this is a great way for me to serve. Um, so I don't have any structure. I mean, how, how do you structure relationship building? To me, it's, it's, it's synonymous with courting. You know, for those of us who have a, a long-term life partner, how do you structure that process of falling in love with someone? You don't. There is no structure to that. It's not always that rational. And I've tried to be rational with some students and, and, it, and it, you know, like purely rational. And, and, and I've had a few that it hasn't worked out or it hasn't been as good of an experience as I expected it to be. And so I, I, I know that you're, you're expecting me to have some level of structure, but, but honestly, it's really a very dynamic and fluid process. And it's a, it's, it's a thing that I, I think I'm feeling a lot more than I am uh, practicing as a logician. I mean, I'm really thinking about, um, you know, is this person, you know, going to add value and I'm going to be able to add value to them. Do they seem really interested in, in this journey and going on this journey together? So, uh, no, I don't have a lot of structure to this courting process. Um, it's more of just a, a passion of mine. And I'm looking for students who share similar passions. You know, they're, they're, they're interested, for, like, for example, uh, both Joe and Lauren have a, quite a, uh, you know, a deep understanding and experience in the weight room. Well, I happen to work in a weight room as a physical therapist. And so, you know, that's a really good thing to have in common. So I think if, if there's something that I'm looking for right now, it's, it's, it's someone who has a passion for strength and conditioning and how that integrates into their practice as a physical therapist. Uh, I'm looking for students who uh, don't have a particular bias or propensity to one specific population because I see the entire lifespan. But, you know, if my employment were to change and some of those things were to change, uh, then I think, you know, again, I'm going to be looking for does this person fit what I'm currently doing uh, or, or does it not? So I, I think it's very fluid. I wish I maybe maybe I should have more structure. But at this juncture, because it's really just me doing this, I don't have to share this with anybody else. It's, it's really based on kind of how that human connection uh, is evolving and growing. Yeah, no, Don, that makes complete sense that it's such a dynamic process depending on, you know, of course, your interactions and kind of how it builds from there. I mean, that certainly seems to make sense. And I know Joe and Lauren, you both had kind of mentioned a little bit, of course, about the, um, you know, the preclinical uh, dialogue and relationship building at that point. Was there anything kind of more you guys wanted to add to your previous points and kind of how it was from a student perspective before you entered that clinical? Uh, yes. So first of all, anyone who knows Don a little bit knows he, he is just a master connector. With He uh, is always on his earphones talking to someone when he's not face to face with someone. And just because he really likes having that personal relationship with somebody and who doesn't really. So from the start, uh, Don was at one of our labs since he's a, a, on South College faculty, and he just thought very differently than everyone else. We have a lot of researchers on staff, very wonderful fellows, and uh, Don is a clinician as first and foremost, and so he just thought very differently than our some of our professors, and I immediately was drawn to that. I was like, I want to learn from that guy, and uh, so <laughs> that very day, I ended up Googling him and I found this other interview he had done with, uh, it was about mentorship, I believe. And he, he said the thing about how he, he always looks for people who answer his call. So from that moment, I was like, all right, anytime he calls me, I'm going to answer and I'm going to put myself out there and make sure that I foster this connection. And uh, that's exactly what I did. And it really was a natural evolution while it was a little bit uncomfortable, like you know, Instagramming my professor or calling my professor at first, it just, uh, it never felt, uh, it just really felt like a friendship was growing. And it ended up, towards the end, it just, it really felt like a mutual selection between me and Don um, to, to choose this whole clinical experience. Very nice. And Joe, any other thoughts to add on to that topic as well? Yeah, I think the most important thing is, is feeling comfortable with who you're going to be working with. And the more you can, you know, speak on the front end, 
uh, whether that's multiple times, you know, for shorter durations or a couple longer conversations, I think is the most important thing. We're all going to have different practice patterns, you know, as we evolve and as students, we're going to, you know, probably look a lot like our clinical instructor right off the bat. And then as, as we develop a little bit more, things are going to change. So I think what's more important than trying to find somebody who practices in the way you think you want to practice is being around somebody who you're just comfortable with and have your conversations with. And that way you can bounce ideas off of each other. And I'm sure you'll find some things that you're instructed that, you know, you may want to do differently when you have a little bit more freedom. And so instead of getting tied down on you know, maybe who knows the most people or you know, who has a practice pattern similar to what you think you want to do, I've heard a lot of, you know, classmates and, and people in some conferences who, you know, thought they wanted to go into outpatient orthopedics and now they love peds or inpatient. So I think feeling most comfortable with the person is the number one thing and everything else will fall into place from there. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare a telehealth platform is a simple, low-cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.